Welcome to the Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor. Now, here's your host, Tom Lindquist. Glad to have you back in the Leadership Lyceum, where we bring you direct access to top CEOs and directors of boards in an interview format that provides insight on situational issues that confront CEOs every day. It is a CEO's virtual mentor. This is part two of episode four, with a release delayed by a little summer vacation interlude. So welcome back to us all and happy summer. This is part two of episode four with Brian Shin, CEO of U.S. Silica. Since it's been a few weeks, I'll remind you that Brian and I sat down at the University Club of Chicago on May 18th, 2016. As president and CEO, he set the company on a new strategic direction and transformed the company through an IPO to the delight of his private equity investors, Golden Gate Capital, during his first year as CEO. The timing of the IPO in early 2012 was predicated on the new strategic move for the company into high growth oil and gas sector fracking applications for its products, which we know is a highly volatile environment. In part one, you'll recall that we introduced Brian and U.S. Silica and provided a bit of an historic overview. The interview covered Brian's experience of leading an IPO. In this part two, we will cover Brian's experience of leading the company through a downturn with some of its concomitant facts and circumstances and Brian's attendant actions as CEO. We'll be right back after this to reconvene our discussion with Brian. Stay tuned. Based on the company's strong awareness of cyclicality in U.S. Silica's business, Brian took measures to conservatively manage the balance sheet, including its cash position and leverage. They maintained and managed a competitive cost profile at the plant level and continued to address their plant cost profile as prices begin to impact profitability. Let's join back into the interview. I think it's fascinating. The business that everyone seemed to be very attracted to in the oil and gas side, that's changed substantially right now. And you're taking a lot of measures to control costs and you're looking at strategy through the industrial and specialty products area. Talk about the experience of operating in a downturn. It's particularly interesting to me, even though we were new, relatively new to the oil and gas market, uh, we knew, because we have a lot of oil and gas old hands, you might say, that that, um, helped run that business for us, but we knew that the industry is cyclical. And and I think some of our competitors and others in in different parts of the oil field value chain uh, forgot that. Uh, they somehow felt like this was going to be up and to the right forever. And so if you look at the decisions that we made in terms of investment, uh, how we managed our balance sheet, we kept a a lot of cash on on the balance sheet, a variety of other things, uh, we were more conservative. We still had the the very aggressive growth, but we did it in in a way that we didn't over lever the company. And almost all of our competitors and, and so many people around the oil field space took advantage of, of, of low interest rates and just, just borrowed uh, too much money. And so we stayed pretty conservative. And so that's the good news for us is that we're going to be around to see the end of this movie. Uh, others perhaps won't, won't be. But, but that said, you know, profitability has dropped substantially on the uh, oil and gas side of our business. And so we've done a lot of things um, there. We've been pretty aggressive in, in the market in, in taking share, for example. Uh, that was one of our key strategies as we came into this downturn. Uh, if you look, we started, when we ended 2014 with about 12% market share in oil and gas. Uh, we exited last year at 18%, so we grew share by 50%, and we've taken more share in the first quarter of this year. So we've gone from you know, literally not that long ago, maybe having 5 to 7% share, to now we're over 20% share in, in the market. And uh, one of the ways that we could do that is, is that when we built our manufacturing base, we only um, built low-cost plants, so we're at the bottom of the cost curve. Once again, another thing that, that we did to uh, prepare in case the cyclicality you know, came sooner than, uh, than expected. Many of our competitors didn't, didn't do that. Uh, but still, with all that said, you know, we, we have too much cost. And as we talk a lot, about, a lot internally, uh, we get to choose many things in, in the business, but one of the things we don't get to choose is the price that our customers will pay for our product. Mm-hmm. And it's being set by the market right now, and it's substantially less than what it was uh, in the peak years of, of 13 and, and 14. And so we have to reset our uh, cost profile to be able to, to make a, a reasonable 
profit a reasonable return given those uh, lower expectations. So we've done a number of things. Uh, we've had, uh, gee, I think last count, somewhere between two and 300 individual cost reduction programs. Uh, we've taken out tens of millions of dollars worth of cost, and these are uh, many of these things are not uh, headcount related. These are efficiencies, improvements, and even though we'd already done a lot in, in the company, uh, we found more things, turned over more rocks. Uh, more recently, you know, we have had some uh, some people reductions. I think uh, in the last 12 to 14 months, we've reduced our uh, staff on the salary side by about third, a third, so about 30 percent reduction. Um, so, so we're taking some of those tough choices, and, and, and that's particularly painful because um, we've brought in uh, you know, so many great people to work at the company, uh, but the reality is we, we just had to make those tough decisions because the, uh, the market just wouldn't allow us to have the cost structure that we had built uh, around growth and, and kind of accelerating growth, and so we had to take some of that cost out. With respect to headcount, how do you go about that? And and had you gone about that before? Did you have to do that at DuPont at all? Had you faced that before? I have uh, certainly. Uh, you know, DuPont's gone through ups and downs in the different businesses, and so you know, we went through several uh, reductions uh, over my uh, my time at DuPont, and I think we did that with the same culture that we talked about earlier, completely open, transparent, do it in a respectful way. And um, we have a lot of open communications with our whole team uh, around the company, uh, around how things are going. So it certainly wasn't a surprise. I mean, for example, you know, every quarter uh, we host a, te- a company-wide town hall meeting. Uh, usually we'll go out to one of our mine sites and host it from, from that location. And we give a kind of a company-wide update on how the uh, you know finances are going and, and various aspects of the company, and so I think everybody could see that that you know, things were deteriorating from a profitability standpoint, and we were honest and open on, on those sessions and talking about the need to potentially you know reduce staff and a variety of other things. So um, while I say it wasn't a surprise, perhaps, but certainly if if you're one of the, the people that's uh, unfortunately, being you know being let go, it, it's never a positive experience. But mm-hmm. I think we we handle it as as well as you can, given that it's not it's not great news for for the individual. And it, I think it was particularly frustrating because we brought a lot of these great folks in, and, and the vision at that time was that we were really going to grow a lot. And I think we'll still get back on that growth path, but it feels like we've we've taken a bit of a pause, given you know oil uh, being uh, where it's been for the last several quarters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you think you mentioned in the earnings call, uh, lower for longer. In terms of specifics, and I'm thinking about the listeners, uh, if they're having to go through uh, reduction in force, is there a way to do it that maybe lessens the blow? Well, certainly there's all the, the, the traditional things where there's you know there's severance packages and, and there's benefits continuation for a certain period of time and, and all those things. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's uh, certainly a challenge. I think that the best thing you can do is not avoid the tough decisions. Don't prolong it. You know, once you know you have to take the action, um, you do it in a respectful way. Uh, you try and treat people as fairly as you can. Um, you know, like I, I have two two sons who are out in the workforce. We were talking about that earlier. Um, you know, I think about if it was my sons that were sort of being reduced. Like, how would I want them to be treated by their company? And so, you know, keep those things in mind and. They treat people with a sort of dignity and, and respect, um, and uh, you, you just sort of work your way through it. You know, there's no, I don't think there's any easy um, sort of answer here. It's yeah. just you have to make the tough decisions, and, um, and and then you have to move on. How and when did you realize that it needed to be done? Is it is it a report that you're seeing, numbers that you're seeing? Is, it may, and maybe it's a completely obvious question, but when when is the moment when you look and you say, I, I need to do something and I need to do it? quick well I think I think for us um, we we have quite a war chest of cash that we've we've built up we did that uh, primarily to be able to go out and do acquisition as I reminded our team internally a lot that, that cash was not there to sort of slowly drain away um, because we had poor earnings and poor results right I think that would be kind of dereliction of duty to our investors and, and so uh, when I saw our cash balance starting to, to decline a small amount, and for me, that was that was the point where I said, "Look, we have to take some action here, and, and we've committed to get back uh, by the end of this year to cash flow positive, even mm-hmm. if the market doesn't improve, and with the lower cost structure that we have, uh, we'll be able to do that." And I think, as we talk to the organization about this, this notion of 
look, it's nothing we did wrong. Uh, the, the market has just reset what can it, it can afford to pay right now for our products. And, you know, we just have to adjust our cost structure to, to deal with that. I think people understood that. You know, you know certainly if, if you were the ones, if you were someone who's being impacted, it didn't feel very good. And you also have to remember, it's not just the people that leave, but the people who, who remain, uh, their jobs change as well. Mm-hmm. And many of them are kind of thinking, okay, what's next, right? So we work closely with, with the folks um, who are still with the company and make sure that they understand to the best that, uh, of our ability to communicate it, you know, what's likely to happen and are there, is there more things coming? You know, we get a lot into a lot of those discussions. It's interesting. As you talk about the people that are, that are at the company after this, You've got to preserve those those values that you talk about with safety ethics, um, with with treating each other well, and, and how do you focus back on that and make sure that uh, people are keeping the core values? I think you, you just have to be very mindful of it and, and put some extra organizational energy into that. Spend mm-hmm. more time talking to people, and uh, it's not necessarily in that case in, in sort of a town hall fashion. It's more of a Kind of flow down through the organization. It's, it's face to face. It's it's asking individual managers to spend more time uh, with their folks and, and understand what the concerns are and and, and help deal with those and, and things they can't deal with and maybe sort of bubble up to the organization so some of us can can help with that. Uh, that's the best way I know of to, to handle it. We find the cash balance trigger to be very insightful. Before the downturn, there was a stated and earmarked use for cash on the balance sheet. During the downturn, there is a potential drain on that cash for an alternative, unplanned use of that cash. This acts to clarify and focus the business decision that must come for business survival. This clarity around a financial measure and trigger helps to avoid the brooding, the temporizing, the reticence that can plague a leader faced with a painful reduction in force decision. Let's take a break. We're back with Brian Shin, CEO of U.S. Silica. From the customer perspective, and you talked about that on the earnings call and uh, what you're doing from your customer perspective, it sounded like they seem to understand and you're taking some measures with customers too. Talk about that a bit and your approach to, to the customers. Well, look, I, you know, Tom, I'm not sure if it's good news or bad news, but uh, the customers in many cases are in the same boat we are in, or perhaps even worse. We've cut you know, 30%, they've cut 50 or 60% of their workforce. And um, they, they get it, for sure. And I think that uh, our challenge in all this is, as you said, to maintain our values, but also to maintain our service to the customers. And also to remember that um, while we have different conditions in the oil and gas right now, we have a whole industrial business on the other side of the company that uh, is experiencing record growth. And so it's this kind of strange dynamic within the company, and many of our uh, mine sites serve both oil and gas and industrial. So you're trying to take cost out on one side, but then the other side of the company, you know, those folks are saying, well, wait a minute, you know, our demand continues to go up, so you can't reduce this position or you can't. So that added another dynamic. Now, most of our competitors and almost all of our customers are 100% uh, focused on oil and gas, and they don't have a, an offsetting business. Uh, so it's one of the luxuries we have, quite honestly. It helps balance out our, our earnings and our cash, but at the same time, in, the, in this um, time of, of having to take out cost and, and reduce positions and reorganize, uh, it made it a bit more challenging because we didn't want to harm uh, the industrial side of the business, which is, as I said, making record profits. Very interesting. As you talk about your facilities or your mines uh, serving both segments, I imagine if they were just serving oil and gas out of there, that you could lose a lot of the esprit de corps in that facility or that mine. Well, w- once again, it, it goes back to something I said earlier. W- when we set up our business model, uh, you know, conservative on the balance sheet, don't over the company, and we're diversified. So if you look at, uh, across our company, uh, we have more than 2,000 customers only about 50 of those are oil and gas. So the vast majority of our customers are not oil and gas. We have 250 plus products, uh, only about 10 of those products are oil and gas. So, so we have a huge presence on the other side, 
Now, some of those are not as profitable as oil and gas, particularly when oil and gas was much stronger than it is mm-hmm. today. But, but still, you know, we set the company up in a conservative way, recognizing that there was going to be some cyclicality in oil and gas. I guess, frankly speaking, I'm not sure any of us expected we'd see $20 oil, right? We can't claim to, to be that prescient. But I think we all knew that there was some risk there, certainly just based on, on past oil and gas cycles. Let's take a break. We're back with Brian Shen, CEO of U.S. Silica. And let's cover one of the most basic questions. What do you do as CEO? I think it's kind of interesting because it it takes you down some some roads and and maybe it's not necessarily what, what people would think. So... Um, you know, I've thought a lot about that, and, and there's five things that I've identified that I spend most of my time on, and most of these are somewhat unique to the CEO position, right? So the first is, is set the strategy for the company. Obviously, I have a lot of help doing that and the board and all, but at the end of the day, I feel very responsible for that. Uh, the second we've talked about a lot, and that's the culture. And I feel like I'm the standard bearer for, for the culture of the company, and it's in some very sort of overt ways, but it's a lot of subtle things, too people are always watching for. I think the third thing is build a leadership team and maintain the, those capabilities that you need on that leadership team to achieve your, your strategy. The fourth, and this is an interesting one that I usually get into a lot of discussion on, is this notion of balance the needs of our stakeholders. And maybe we can come back to that in a minute. I think it's, a, it's an interesting thought. And then the fifth is to be the voice of the company externally, particularly to, to the market. And between those five things, I probably spend 80% of, of my time. Um, on the stakeholder holder balance, you know, as I thought long and hard about the, the choices and decisions you have to make as CEO, is frequently trying to balance the needs between two, two or more of our four stakeholders. So you think of it, who are our stakeholders? Well, we have customers, uh, we have investors, we have our more than a thousand colleagues around the company. And then we have sort of society at large, more specifically the 17 communities around the country where we have, have our mind sites. And in many cases, the CEO is the only one that can really make the big trade-offs between those, those stakeholders. Just to sort of be introspective a bit and really think about where do you spend your time across those five specific roles and then within this stakeholder balance thing, just being conscious of the fact that when you make decisions, they're trade-offs, right? I know we all sort of know that at some intuitive level, but really thinking about in almost every big decision you make, there's at least two of these stakeholder groups that you're trying to find that right balance. And it seems to me like companies that get in trouble, particularly with with their investors or with their boards, they get out of balance. One of these stakeholder groups is not being served in, in the appropriate manner, and that's what gets them in trouble. You gave an excellent example of a specific in in that regard earlier when I asked you about when did you realize that you had to do a cost reduction or a reduction in force, and you talked about balancing between two of these stakeholders, the investors who probably want you to preserve uh, the cash for more profitable investments for them and for the company and your your colleagues. And... uh, that's a yeah. very tough trade-off. There. It's, it's, it's a great example. You know, another one we get into frequently is a mining company. Uh, you know, we have a, a thousand or two thousand acre tract of land, sometimes somewhat embedded within communities. Mm-hmm. And so, how do you balance the needs of the community versus uh, the needs of, of customers or, or investors? In, in some cases, we spend a lot of time thinking about that. How do we be a good neighbor? Um, but you know, th- those are the kind of things that we're always talking about. I think it just helps. It helps you kind of get your head around it if, if you just call it out for what it is. It's like we have to balance the needs of these stakeholders and kind of every once in a while just take an inventory and say, where do you think you are opposite these, these four and, or any one of them getting too much attention or not enough enough attention? Give me an example of, of, a, of a customer trade-off or a customer dilemma where you're trading off between the stakeholders. This is a real example. You know, one of our plants, uh, we knew we had to take a piece of equipment down for, for maintenance. And the, the, the risk was that, you know, it, it could fail. And if it failed, it could, you know, put some dust out that would potentially, you know, be harmful to the community. But we knew if we shut that down, we'd lose a lot of production, lose a lot of profit. So we made the decision to shut it down. It didn't matter how much, how much profit we lost. But, you know, we said, look, we've got to protect the, the community and, and the environment. There's just a constant stream of those, 
those decisions and you, know, you don't realize it at the time because you're in the middle of it and you kind of get caught in the details but when you step back you realize okay I just made that trade off and what, what, what's that balance and um, you know how do your communities feel about you as, as, a, as a mining company in, in the community you know and um, what kind of input are you getting from them what are their concerns you know, in a lot of our uh, locations we have some truck traffic that goes through town or we have rail cars that when the rail cars are being moved it, I mean it sounds like a small issue but in, in some of these towns, when our rail cars are being moved, it, it stops traffic in the town. So things like that, you know, we're, we're always balancing off where, where are we and what accommodations can we make to sort of make sure that we keep keep all that in balance. You seem, Brian, that you're very visible in the regions and the communities. Did that come from the DuPont upbringing and the proximity to the plants that you came up in? Or? Yeah, I think you... Um, I think you get a respect for it. I remember um, I'd gone to work at a new site in, in West Virginia, and uh, the first day on the job, I was managing kind of like half the plant when I was in operations. And the plant manager said, okay, come with me. We're going to go up this back road, and I want to show you something. So, so we get in a car, and we ride up there, and there's a small community kind of anchored by a local church. And we went, went to meet the pastor of the church, who was kind of the community leader. And the plant manager looked at me and said, look, you know, across the street from this, is the world's largest freestanding ammonia tank, which we had on this plant. And if anything ever happens to this tank, everybody up in this road, you know, they're in serious trouble. So it just brings it home when you see those kind of things and just my, sort of my cultural upbringing in a company that was focused on safety and, and environmental uh, responsiveness and just the, the, this notion that, look, you never would get anybody hurt and you never make the wrong trade off there. I think that's put a pretty heavy imprint on me in terms of uh, how we treat our communities as a company in these communities. We're guests, sort of a, a local house guest, if you will, in the community. And we've all had house guests come and stay with us, some who are house guests we'd love to invite back, others that we'll kick out at the first <laughs> chance, right? And you'd rather be the former, not the latter. And, um, you know, you want to you wanna build, up, build up that trust with the community. Let's take another quick break. We're back with Brian Shin, CEO of U.S. Silica. Let's cover some advice for those who aspire to the CEO position. It's one of the things I've learned in my career is that if you want to move on to, to the next thing, something that's you know maybe more responsibility, a, a, you know, a better job, quote unquote, you better be doing a good job in your current role. Mm -hmm. So d don't start sort of looking up the organization line so far that you forget about the, the basics, which is you know to do do a great job in, in your current role. Um, I think I love it when younger people in our organization, I can see that they're thinking strategically. So if you want to become a member of senior management, whether it's a CEO or some other sort of C-suite position, you tend to think about things differently. It's a much more strategic perspective. And so you'd like to see that demonstrated in, in folks. Um, I would also say that, uh, at least for the kind of companies that I've been associated with, it would be really hard to imagine being a CEO if you didn't have some commercial background, mm -hmm. some background in sales and marketing. Um, I, I think so much of what you do is is based off of the customers, and if you have the skill set to be able to deal with the customers in an external world, it equates to, as we said earlier, investors, communities, you know, being sort of at ease and interacting in those kind of scenarios. I feel like my experience, people with sales and marketing background have have that. And I guess the last thing I would say is is to be upfront about your desire. You know, to talk with your leadership, uh, make it known to people that you have a desire to to um, continue to progress in the organization, and, and be specific and say, look, I, I'd like to be a CEO someday. What does what does that take? And you'd be surprised, um, you know, how many people will sort of take you under their wing, and you know, maybe talk to the CEO in your current company. You have an opportunity to to get on that person's radar screen, and, and you know. He or she could mentor you um, as well. So, you know, it's uh, it's not a perfect list, but uh, you know, that's the kind of advice that I would give folks when they ask me that question. Let me let me come back to some of these right now and and ask you on the think strategically front. We hear it a lot. When are they thinking strategically? What are you seeing them do that says he's on the track or she's on the track? So, so I guess the 
kind of analogy I would use is I, I think about is this person playing checkers mm-hmm. or are they playing chess? So is this sort of a simple game or is it one where you're thinking several moves ahead? Well, I was in a meeting the other day and, and a kind of a younger associate in the company was making a presentation and um, he was talking about you know, this sort of decision that, that he was suggesting that we make or recommending, but he'd put together three or four thoughts on, and here's the next thing, and here's the implications of that, and here's you know what'll happen two years from now, and here's how this fits into this. It was clear that he'd thought beyond that specific decision. He mm-hmm. was thinking about the implications. And that's what I like to see. That That's what I mean by thinking strategically. There, We can all sort of focus on the tactical win here, but you know sometimes the tactical win doesn't really flange up with the long-term strategic intent of the company. So if somebody can demonstrate to me that they understand where we're trying to go with the company and if they want to get a decision made, demonstrate very clearly how this moves us closer to that end game, uh, to me that is is sort of thinking and acting Mm -hmm. strategically versus a tactical win. There's lots of people that get the tactical wins, but uh, to me, the if you want to be the CEO or in, in the in the C-suite, you have to kind of think beyond j- just today. Raise your vision up and and look out a bit. On the commercial background and that skill set, at Dupont, you were moved into a commercial role after all the years of operations. Right. How did that happen? What did you do to inspire that? So, so Dupont kind of had a, an unwritten tradition that if you were one of the top performers in manufacturing, you could choose if you wanted to do something different. Mm-hmm. And so I was fortunate enough to, to, to be in, in, in that situation. And, uh, you know, I was sitting here in, in, in manufacturing looking out and I thought this the sales guys, you know, they had it made. I mean, they were out on the golf course entertaining customers. It looked like a pretty good good job and something something interesting to me that I wanted to, to learn more about. And so I uh, asked to, to have the opportunity to go, go run a business. And you know, as, a, as you find out, the grass is not always greener on the other side, right? Uh, but, but that's how I got into it. I, I, I had a desire to, uh, you know, all kidding aside, to, to kind of get my hands on all, all aspects of the business uh, and to be able to move the, the knobs and the levers. And I was really fortunate inside DuPont, particularly in the chemicals group at the time, uh, we had uh, 20, 20 or 22 different businesses that were kind of small and medium size. Mm-hmm. And so you had your own P&L at a relatively small level. It wasn't uh, some gigantic business that was a billion-dollar business that you'd never you know, give to a, a younger person. So I really learned to c- cut my teeth on that, and this business had um, all the elements you could think of. It had sales, marketing, had operational challenges. Uh, it was a, a global business. Uh, we had a lot of um, safety and health things associated with the product line, so I got to spend time with toxicologists and learn the science aspect and all that. And it just had, it was a very interesting business, and I, and I was quite fortunate to, to get that at a fairly early point in my career. And from then on, I, I knew that um, I wanted to, to be involved in the, kind of on the business side, sales, marketing, you know, P&L, um, and uh, that's what I've done ever since. You mentioned demonstrating your desire and letting, letting someone know, your boss know, that that's what you, you aspire to do. I can imagine that probably invites a feedback to to get you there. It, it's a two way street. They, you mentioned that to them, and now they're they know your ambition, and so they're looking out and probably giving you feedback that may not have come. No, it's uh, it's true, Tom, and I think you know it sounds like sort of trite advice, but um, finding mentors along the way is is critical. And um, you know, I was associated with a number of programs where you would sort of be assigned a mentor. Mm-hmm. For me, that never worked very well. I, I like to find my own mentors. You just It's that way, I think. That we all have a natural rhythm with some people and others you just don't. Nothing against either person, but some, sometimes you just click with, with people. And I found a few of those folks in, in my career that, uh, that really helped me out and uh, taught me a lot of things. So you, you learn a lot, and so I'd encourage folks to, to find that, that person, even if it's not an official mentor, uh, look for Look for someone who's, uh, you know, a couple levels up in the organization. Maybe has a different view, and can uh, be somebody that you can go to and, and be be open and, and honest with. So hopefully, somebody that's not in your direct line of uh, of management. It's harder with a smaller company like U.S. Silica. It was easier with with Dupont. It was easy to find, you know, find folks that you could could click with in other parts of the company. Are you doing anything to promote that in your organization? So, so we don't we don't do the official mentoring, mm-hmm. but as I said, you know, we, we encourage that time and, and encourage people to, to find those um, those mentors and uh, you know I do some of it myself and certainly it's you know there's this sort of official thing where let's sit down and talk but then there's 
just pulling people aside when you see things, and, you know, to either reinforce things that were really good and say, wow, I'd love to see you do more of that, or taking people aside or taking them out to lunch and saying, wow, let, let's just sort of, sort of chat around, you know, here's a couple of things you might, you might think about. Um, I think that uh, you know, finding a way to, to give back and, and to, to help people along, uh, uh, kind of the next generation, the generation behind them, uh, is, uh, is certainly the right thing to do. What do you do for fun? Yeah, so uh, my wife and I like to travel. Uh, I play golf, although poorly. Um, you know, we uh, like to uh, spend time with our family mostly. I would say if I had to pick one thing, it's it's that. Um, I know I, it's it's uh, it's interesting. You look back over your career, and even with all the traveling I did, I always managed to to be there for most of my my children's school activities and things like that. I would sort of flex my schedule around. And sometimes it was a bit difficult, but uh, you know, I'd encourage folks to. To think about that. I mean, those times only come by once, and if you're working for the kind of company that doesn't understand that, you're probably working for the wrong company. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's another thing we try to do. At US Silicon, you talk about the culture, right? It's a lot of it is like we, somebody says, "Hey, I need to be at my son's school this morning. I have to reschedule a meeting." Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Nobody complains. It's great because we all do it. So I think it's just a cultural thing. But um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pretty boring person, actually. Right? It's it's just a lot of uh, a lot of work. It uh, work consumes. A, Quite a bit of time as a CEO of a public company. Boy, we've hit uh, hit a lot here in a relatively short period of time. We have, and thank you for doing this, Brian. This it's has a been pleasure. great. Thanks, Excellent. Tom. For more information on Brian Shin, U.S. Silica, the Leadership Lyceum, Golden Gate Capital, please see the reverse side of this album cover, where we'll have various important links for you to follow. <music> The Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor, has been a production of the Leadership Lyceum, LLC. Copyright 2016, all rights reserved. Come back and listen. It's lonely at the top.